Um, this presentation today um, is the first, and it's book the, 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 the series is bookended with two different historical um, uh, sessions. Um, mine on Bishop Whipple and then uh, Fred's on St. Augustine. And um, as I thought about things this morning, um, I thought actually Whipple and Augustine are kind of of a piece. So I think maybe, um, maybe this will actually uh, do a decent job of framing um, uh, uh, the important discussions uh, that will continue. Um, in particular, because what I want to wrestle with today is um, the conflation or the confusion of my view of the common good with God's um, image of the common good. And I think therein lies the kind of moral ambiguities of this figure who is sometimes called a saint um, uh, among us, the first Bishop of Minnesota, Henry Benjamin Whipple. Um, but uh, among um, Native Studies historians is kind of exhibit A in cultural genocide. Um, so I'd like to kind of play out for you a bit of the, that ambiguity and to think with you some, um, uh, to think with uh, uh, um, Bishop Whipple some, um, uh, this, um, this issue. Sam, I'm trying to um, share a screen and it says it's disabled by the host. You're on mute. Sorry. Yep. Let's see if let's see if we can fix that. Okay. Um, give it a shot now. <laughs> it says I'm still unable to. All right. Well, I'm going to make you the host then. Perfect. And then and then I'll return the favor later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and, everybody. Yeah. All right, are you able to do it now? I am indeed. Thank you so awesome. much. Okay, hopefully, hopefully this is visible to everybody. I'll try to make it a little. Uh... There we go. Is it visible? It yes. is. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, um, I'm a church historian. Um, you may know me mostly as somebody who works with Anishinaabe communities, but um, fundamentally I was trained as an American religious historian. And um, the notable um, uh, Lutheran uh, church historian, Martin Marty, who uh, wrote in Christian Century for years and may be known to some of you, um, did a, a really um, insightful um, church historians um, have a particular challenge keeping the Christian faith. And that's because, I suppose like lawyers um, in their own work, um, church historians spend a lot of time with the underbelly of the Christian tradition, ways that it never seems to fully uh, uh, meet up with its um, ideals. Um, in my uh, work, especially for my first two books, I spent... Um, uh, I read through the papers of Henry Benjamin Whipple, Minnesota's first Episcopal bishop, two times um, over two books. Um, 45 boxes of his papers. They're at the Minnesota Historical Society. I calculated I've probably spent 300 hours um, with this guy. And if you had that, um, uh, that pleasure of spending that much time in the biography of somebody, um, you, you, come to, you come to appreciate just how complex they are and how... Um, any person um, resists the boxes um, that uh, uh, the stories we tell either in a family or that historians tell, they resist those boxes um, pretty handily. Um, the, the, um, the thing is, those of us um, who are Episcopalians in Minnesota spend a lot of time um, uh, valorizing, um, lifting up Henry Whipple as, um, as a, an exemplar of the faith. Um, and um, especially so, I suppose, with respect to his courageous stands on behalf of uh, Native peoples, both in the church and in the broader society. Uh, and so um, at first glance, he seems like a really good model for us to kind of turn to at the kind of core of who we are as Minnesota Episcopalians. Uh, but as I said, um, uh, if you kind of zoom out um, some, um, his uh, vision for um, uh, the assimilation of Native peoples, the work of Christian missions, 
boarding schools and other practices of civilization among them um, became some of the, the most um, afflicting historical trauma um, moves um, made. And uh, he, has, he has become sort of a, a symbol of that um, as well. Um, and we don't really talk about that so much. So what I'd like to do um, is to think with him, um, not to diss him, not to cancel him, um, but to kind of think with him as a fellow um, Christian uh, on the path um, and uh, hopefully identify um, uh, in our own moment um, how appreciating him as a man of his times um, gives us a chance to both uh, commend um, the courage that he had um, and uh, also to um, identify and be aware of the places um, which you could call arrogance or cultural arrogance, but I guess it can be summed up with where God's vision of the common good um, was conflated with his own vision of the common good. Uh, and then what can we uh, learn from this? Um, so a couple quick um, matters of biography, and then I'm gonna turn to a couple of key moments in his uh, ministry in Minnesota, and then we'll open it up for discussion. First of all, he's born in uh, 1820s in upstate New York, raised as a Presbyterian. He goes to Oberlin College, which is led at that time by one of the key revivalists of the, of the Second Great Awakening, Charles Finney. Um, it's a place of incredible fervor, uh, religious fervor. It's a, it's a kind of a place where um, uh, people went to train to become um, on fire Christians huh, for uh, missionary work. Um, but also um, missionary work of a particular sort, maybe more like a Peace Corps kind of volunteer than like a Bible thumper that we might think of today as a missionary. Um, Oberlin was um, rabidly anti-slavery and um, way ahead of its time in being Ohio's first inter, um, uh, gender um, uh, inclusive um, uh, institution, um, co-educational, and uh, was, was it, um, being reminded that he attended Oberlin um, helps me understand his formation, I guess I should say. Um, he becomes um, uh, an Episcopalian uh, in part through his um, new wife, Cornelia, um, and uh, some grandparents who had been Episcopalians. I think actually that's pretty cool that he becomes an Episcopalian in the 1840s because I don't want to say that's a time when it was uncool to be an, an Episcopalian, but um, it was certainly kind of the norm for folks in upstate New York to be kind of swept up in the evangelical revivals and be focused on their own, uh, you know, uh, transformation, conversion experience. And people who were drawn to the Episcopal tradition at that time, especially if they converted to it, um, were folks who had a more realistic view of the Christian life, that the Christian life is one that is lived out over the course of a life that doesn't all hinge on a conversion moment. It's a, a growth in maturity, which I think um, you and I as members of Trinity would uh, recognize as, uh, as, as more familiar and perhaps the path um, that we seek. He moves to Chicago on somewhere on the south side, of course, in 1857. It looked a lot different than it does when it becomes a huge urban area, and then becomes consecrated Minnesota's first uh, bishop in 1859. Um, and as you may know, Faribault is the seat of the Diocese of Minnesota, at least early on. Um, and uh, he lived out his days till he died in 1901 in and out of Faribault. Um, uh, in 1859, it's important to remember that Minnesota was more a native place than it was a Euro-American place or an immigrant place. Um, and uh, when he arrived as the first um, uh, 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 Bishop, he um, took to the um, took to the trail uh, pretty early on and went and visited the um, initial um, uh, Episcopal mission, which was at uh, Gull Lake near Brainerd, um, that had been established uh, just a couple years earlier in 1852, um, and uh, it was led by um, uh, an uh, Anishinaabe uh, guy who became a priest named Anamagabu, who. Um, became close friends, uh, lifelong friends with um, Bishop Whipple. The two of them uh, corresponded a great deal and um, uh, uh, really important uh, relationship. Um, uh, but 
uh, Whipple uh, has this vision of, um, of missions uh, to the Dakota and Ojibwe of Minnesota that really consumes him and carries him, um, carries him through. Uh, and then um, the, the year 1862 will become a defining moment as we'll see in a moment. Um, but I wanted to relate a couple of fun facts about uh, Whipple. First of all, Red Sox. He, um, he's this kind of uh, um, uh, gentrified kind of gentleman type guy, but he always wore red socks. Um, there was a little playfulness in him uh, that was always underneath all of the uh, vestments and the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, dignity of his office. Um, secondly, he loved fishing. Um, I like that about him. Um, but he, he really, um, uh, yeah, he loved to fish. Um, and thirdly, he's um, arguably Minnesota's first snowbird. Starting in 1870, he somehow wangled it, uh, worked an angle to, be, to run the Diocese of Minnesota from his summer home in Florida, um, where he loved to go tarpon fishing and stuff. So those are fun facts. Um, the, the more uh, relevant facts, um, uh, are how he really did relish um, his travels among Dakota peoples in western Minnesota and Anishinaabe peoples uh, in northern Minnesota, Ojibwe people. Um, you know, this is before railroads, so to go visit missions up at Leech Lake or White Earth or uh, Red Lake involved hopping in a canoe, going up the Mississippi River, portaging, all of that was not a bother to him. It was, um, he, he saw that as part of his, his uh, um, he embraced it as part of his Christian uh, work. Um, and, and I love that about him. Um, he, he didn't learn the languages of Ojibwe and Dakota, but he spent a lot of time sort of engaging the language. Um, he was supportive of Dakota and Ojibwe language worship. Um, he saw to the publication of prayer books and uh, hymnals and, and other stuff. Um, and I, perhaps most importantly, um, he's known for this, but I think it's more that he didn't, he knew enough to not get in the way of um, a, a native leadership of, of the native churches. Um, and then finally, um, it's really clear, uh, you may, may or may not know this, but in, in, a, in a historical society archive, the, the, the Bishop Whipple papers are the things that were in his office that he turned over. Um, and so there's some scrapbooks of things he wrote, but more than that, it's a document, um, it's, a, it's a picture of all the letters that came to him. Um, uh, and uh, so you, you get a kind of a composite picture of who he is, as well as a, um, uh, a document of what he wrote and thought. Um, that's all in there too, because he published a great deal. Um, but what's, what's sort of clear to one in that is that um, he was admired uh, by um, Ojibwe and Dakota leaders. Um, uh, and um, I think part of that was he was respected because he was the serious power broker in the region um, that through the missions they could approach where they couldn't necessarily approach the governor or the Indian agent. Um, and he was in some ways kind of insulated from that. But I think it goes beyond just the fact that he was the man and they were trying to kind of um, uh, butter him up. Um, uh, the, the letters to him reveal sustained relationships that he had with native people. I think that's really, really important to who he is and um, the basis maybe of much of his courage um, that we'll turn to here uh, in a moment. Uh, well, let me turn to that courage. <laughs> so, so the main um, the main story that most folks know about uh, Bishop Whipple is his work in uh, 1862 and 1863. So we know that the um, the Dakota um, mostly uh, in two treaties of 1851 signed um, signed away that there's ways ways that those treaties were contested. Um, most of southern Minnesota, including where Trinity is now, that's in the Treaty of 1851 uh, territory. Parts of Minneapolis uh, were in 1805, um, where I live. Um, so, um, and the U.S. reneged on many of its promises in the 1851 treaties. Um, Ojibwe or uh, Ojibwe people too, but Dakota people were more or less starving. Um, uh, they had. Uh, 
um, uh, rightfully um, wondered what happened to the agreements that the um, the U.S. had made when the Dakota people signed over their homelands and were confined to increasingly small spaces. Uh, and um, this erupted in Little Crow's War, um, as you may know. There was a, it was an anti-colonial uprising, the Dakota War of 1862. Well, the U.S. squashes this um, in um, in short order, and uh, more importantly, it becomes the sort of talk of the nation. This um, wild, fierce, hostile uprising of Dakota people, and how um, this was uh, Exhibit A in um, in, in how native peoples couldn't possibly be um, neighbors to um, Euro-American settlers. Um, Bishop Whipple um, courageously draws on pretty much every shit that he has um, to try to counter that narrative, that there's no place in the American future for native people. Um, he witnesses um, what he has um, seen in his relationships with Dakota and Ojibwe people. Um, he writes the papers, he works angles in Washington. He even goes, and this is the most important thing, I suppose, um, travels to Washington, D.C. Um, when uh, there have been 300 Dakota warriors who had been sentenced to hang for, um, for their supposed war crimes. Um, uh, and there's a whole host of ways that this is an awful uh, um, uh, uh, mockery of uh, even military justice, how this whole thing went down. Uh, and he wants to call attention to that. So he goes to President Lincoln uh, and he persuades Lincoln to commute the sentences of, um, of the majority uh, of those. Um, it's still the case that 38 and then two later are hung um, in Mankato um, on December 26th of 1862. It's true also that um, the uh, sentiment against Dakota people and Native people generally is at such a fever pitch um, that policy changes quickly. The treaties of 1851 are kind of uh, nullified and um, Dakota people are forced in exile to reservations um, in uh, what was then Dakota Territory. So it uh, wasn't quite yet the state of South Dakota, Nebraska, and North Dakota. Um, uh, Whipple goes to bat not only for um, those um, wrongly condemned um, to die, um, but he also goes to bat for the many Dakota people who did not take part in the uprising and is um, pretty much responsible for why Prairie Island Indian community in Red Wing is there and the Lower Sioux community and the Upper Sioux communities um, uh, uh, remain. So he, he makes it possible for some Dakota, a minority, but some Dakota to remain um, in uh, Minnesota. Um, and uh, this image that um, I'm, I've got uh, in front of you here is uh, my favorite image. This, um, this is on the floodplain right below Fort Snelling. So if you're on the Mendota Bridge, this would be right below where you are in the Mendota Bridge where this picture was taken. And um, uh, Dakota people, um, men, women, children, pretty much anybody, were forced to march um, from their homelands west of Mankato to uh, Fort Snelling. Um, and this, this concentration camp is how it's usually re referred to. Um, uh, many died um, in it. Um, to await um, in the winter of 1862-3, to await the opening of the Mississippi um, so fit, uh, in, the, in the spring, to move these people by barge um, to uh, their forced removal locations um, up the Missouri River in uh, Nebraska and South Dakota. And this image I love about um, Whipple because they're kind of in the heart of their despair. Um, not really knowing what was going to happen to them, crowded together in this uh, in this um, sort of inhuman situation. And uh, I was just last week this spot, and you know Fort Snelling is looming. It looks like it's on the out in the, the open, but Fort Snelling is li literally right on top. So if you can imagine people marching around with guns. Um, you just really don't have many options. And and who's there but the Episcopal Bishop of Minnesota, right there in the heart of that pain. 
Um, uh, I think that the the, uh, the caption from the historical society reads that he's um, confirming uh, people, but um, you know, imagine him uh, a little bit earlier in that service, perhaps um, celebrating Eucharist. It's it's a powerful image to me, um, and it's an image that um, connects to me with. Um, the contemporary movement by some of our Episcopalians to, to have um, the uh, federal government change the name of the federal office building over by the airport, which is currently called the Whipple Federal Office Building um, in, uh, in supposed honor of Bishop Whipple. And the movement, <clears throat> excuse me, that movement, if you're familiar with it, is in part because this building is um, a serious um, building for the ICE detentions of um, uh, the um, uh, of people about to be um, uh, deported uh, um, to Mexico, Central America, and other places. Uh, and so the effort um, had been to remove his name from this building. And I see that as consistent with this Whipple, the Whipple that is here. Um, the Reverend Robert Tubles, who some of you may know is the sort of, uh, um, well, he's the, uh, uh, the, the clergy person at um, All Saints Indian Mission um, and also works with the Dakota and Ojibwe community um, ministries um, uh, elsewhere in the diocese. Um, but he's fundamentally an artist. And, and um, Bob did this uh, painting, which is called The 38 Tears of Bishop Whipple. And if I may, I'm gonna try to um, plug him in here. Um, Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Um, here we go. It's going to show four minutes. Ago when the state time. was celebrating their 100th, 150th anniversary as a state, uh, a group of native artists from here in the cities uh, got together and decided that they want to have, have, have their own response to the 150th anniversary of the state. And so as an artist, I was invited to be part of this. And the image that I came up with was uh, almost immediate because being a, a Episcopal clergy uh, serving here in Minnesota, uh, the, the person I wanted to try to portray was Bishop Whipple, and then combine it with the uh, the event that happened, which is probably one of the more, uh, I would say, probably the saddest con, the saddest event that happened in 1862 with the Dakota conflict was the hanging of the 38. So this uh, painting is kind of iconic of that uh, event. It, uh, I want to try to capture everything about it. So with uh, the image of Whipple looking up in the, in the air with the what are like raindrops falling down, but are in fact hangman nooses, 38 individual uh, nooses that I put together to uh, convey that image. So it's uh, one could say the 38 tears of Bishop Whipple or the 38 tears of God raining down upon him. The, uh, the the hangings of the 38 at the time, from what the accounts that I've read of it, of the account of the event, was that um, it was more or less like a blockbuster. It was uh, people came from all around and to witness this event. Public executions were a big deal. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's like a free movie. So everybody came to see this, and then. Um, one person was selected to uh, pull the lever and all 38 were hung in unison. So it was the largest uh, mass execution in American history. And um, so to try to capture that, the whole image, the uh, um, symbolism behind it, and also uh, who Bishop Whipple was. He was a big part of uh, Minnesota history, early Minnesota history as far as the state goes. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in um, bringing the Episcopal Church here, uh, planting the seeds all over the state. Uh, the church, from when he first became the bishop to his, uh, when his episcopate ended in um, the late 19th century, it grew 
by you know just by leaps and bounds. So he was uh, a big part of this um, Minnesota history, which some it's, it's it's interesting how it's all left out in this whole Minnesota history. Like who's Bishop Whipple? You ask most people, I'll say who uh, we don't know who that is, but a uh, uh, big part of the state history. And then of course coupled with the event that happened in. Uh, 1862 on December 26th with the executions. I think that uh, was a big part of uh, uh, a big event that formed his ministry from then to that point on. So it was, uh, you know, Native ministry was, you know, I think pushed him in that direction in a lot of ways. You know, that really defined who he was as a person and how, what his ministry was then about. Now, some people say he's a saint, some people say he's a villain. You know, so we could look at it all different ways, but that's uh, the historical um, accounts that we could read. We could read into it, pull it out of context, and um, use it as we will uh, to serve our own purpose. But the fact is, is that he was somebody who was a complex man who uh, was serving in a church that was pretty much uh, wanted to see the Indians go away, but he was somebody who tried to stop that whole push, and he uh, succeeded in all ways. I don't know, I, I would call him uh, maybe not quite a hero, but somewhere between hero and just a good guy. Um, the late 19th century it grew. So um, uh, I want to talk then about now about um, the other uh, Whipple, uh, with, um, the Whipple who um, is seen as Exhibit A in cultural genocide. Um, and this, uh, this this is kind of uh, zooming out um, from... Yeah, uh, Michael, did you yes, want sir. to go back to your PowerPoint? Oh, I thought we're I still seeing your, We're still seeing your YouTube screen. Thank you so much. No problem. Apologies, thanks for the interruption. There we go. Okay, thank you. So um, so that's like the 1862 is kind of one defining moment as Reverend Tubal's uh, pointed out. And um, when, when, uh, when, when he said, you know, is he a saint or is he a villain? Um, uh, and the, somewhere in between, of course, that's kind of where um, I'm trying to lead our discussion that he's in between, um, but sort of owning both the villainous nature of our, ourselves and uh, our, our sort of better angels is uh, part of the work of, uh, of moral um, uh, reflection, right? So uh, let's kind of zoom out a little bit and, and try to understand a bit of why uh, Bishop Whipple, even though he did some really courageous things against racism in Minnesota, um, was also um, uh, a, a person who um, saw to used his power to to uh, to effect um, uh, uh, policies that uh, instructors. Uh, hey, Mike, Michael, one yes. second. We're getting a lot of background noise, folks. So. If you could make sure everyone's on mute, that would be really awesome. Oh, that's right. You can't. You can't mute, can you? Sorry about that. I can't. No. Cool. All right. I could quickly do that. Shall I quickly mute everybody? Yeah, sure. Why don't you mute everyone? Okay. I'm sorry, this is taking me so long. I have to stop sharing to, in order to see it. Okay. Um. There we go. Found it. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, but hopefully you can still you can still hear me. Good. Good. Okay. So um, we'll move rather rather swiftly now. Um, uh, 
swiftly along. Um, so I want to zoom out um, to what you might say what history has made. Um, maybe not Episcopal stories, but, but the broader history. And that is to see Whipple as one of the chief architects of uh, what's been called assimilation policy. Um, so uh, Whipple um, uh, had a lot of political uh, uh, capital and uh, he used it as in the case of 1862 to good things. Um, and he also used it into what he thought was a good thing, which was maybe from his own perspective, the best way forward for native people, even though it wasn't what native people themselves were saying was the best way forward for them. Um, he advocated as reforms this uh, set of policies um, called assimilation policy, uh, which included um, the allotment of land, um, boarding school education, and a set of uh, rules that eff effectively um, uh, criminalized um, uh, non-Christian native religious practices. Um, and George Tinker, um, uh, the, uh, uh, an Osage, um, uh, divinity school professor, a Methodist minister, um, uh, who wrote a book called uh, Missionary Conquest, The Gospel and Cultural Genocide, um, uh, finds in uh, Bishop Whipple one of the four examples of the sort of most um, prominent uh, Christian voices um, that, that produced the circumstances of what um, Tinker identifies as cultural genocide. The effective, this is how he describes that, the effective destruction of a people by systematically or systemically, intentionally or unintentionally in order to achieve other goals, destroying, eroding, or undermining the integrity of the culture and system of values that defines a people and gives them life. I'm gonna move more quickly than my slides um, uh, suggest I should here. Um, um, but Whipple, uh, from every, every, pretty much every year, the rest of his life, he went to upstate New York to this um, retreat center, Lake Mohawk, um, where a group of, um, uh, sort of like the Aspen Ideas Festival, you might say, of, um, of the Indian problem. Um, and uh, at, at this place, um, they kind of cooked up a group of people with, with Whipple as one of the main leaders. Um, cooked up a system uh, of assimilation, which saw um, native peoples no longer as members of distinct nations, speaking their own languages with their own religions and so forth, and saw them instead as, um, as individuals uh, capable of conversion to Christianity and to civilization uh, as defined by your American uh, ideals. The first um, prong of this assimilation policy was allotment, the breaking up of collective property, which was seen as the opposite of civilization, into family um, farms um, owned by male heads of household. Um, and this, uh, this stress of private property may not, may not seem like something that Episcopal um, leaders would be much interested in, but it was um, thought to be necessary to conversion of Christians, um, that people would know the value of land and how to improve it. Um, this is a map of the White Earth Reservation. Pretty much the entire thing is the boundaries of the White Earth Reservation. Bishop Whipple played a big role in the creation of the White Earth Reservation in 1867, 1868. The idea was to remove all um, Minnesota's Anishinaabe people from other parts of the state to White Earth, which had better farmland than some of the other places around Red Lake and Leech Lake and those places. And the idea was this was gonna be kind of a greenhouse where good agrarian, Christian, Euro-American civilization-minded native people could become um, good citizens of the United States and then have their interests protected uh, by US law. But the, the impact of allotment was that um, uh, ultimately it, it, it authorized the stripping of native land. So what you see in red is what native people actually own, either the tribe or individuals um, on the White Earth Reservation. Um, and this is played out um, uh, across the country. Two thirds of native lands, even those that were on reservations are suddenly gone. Um, uh, I'll skip over that. Um, the second piece is um, the boarding schools. And you probably know a fair bit about this, but in uh, beginning in the 1870s, 
um, uh, a former uh, Civil War Army um, uh, officer uh, had this idea that um, you could actually uh, take um, uh, um, native warriors and kind of remake them. Um, and he started uh, this, um, this uh, boarding school process um, in northern Florida where uh, our friend Bishop Whipple was spending his summers, right? Remember? Um, but this is uh, the, um, the, the famous line of, of Richard Pratt who kind of founded this idea of the boarding school was to um, save, the, um, save the man by killing the Indian. That was his motto and it sounds kind of horrible to us, uh, to our ears now, but it was, um, was kind of a clarion call um, at the time. Um, he wrote, in Indian civilization, I'm a Baptist because I believe in immersing the Indians in our civilization and we, when we get them under holding them there until they're thoroughly soaked, um, which I found um, in, when I was reading his uh, memoir uh, to be kind of indicative. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an incredibly violent um, weaponization, right, of the notion of baptism. Um, uh, Bishop Whipple, for his part, um, says, I do not remember to have ever met a person with whom I was drawn more strongly and in whose work I have felt so deep an interest. Uh, and so Whipple, um, it's not just that he thinks Pratt is a good guy and that I've taken this, con this quote out of context and so forth, but it is to suggest the alignment of, um, of vision um, for what would be best for Native people would be to remake them as non-Native people. Um, and uh, at Lake Mohawk, um, they, they issue a resolution that, that um, among other things, eventually um, uh, 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 demands that all boarding school education happen in English and English only, which is part of the um, um, dissolution and fragmentation of all the native languages. Uh, um, and all of this is happening um, with uh, taxpayer dollars uh, but with the full cahoots of um, the denominations and the Episcopal denomination um, is not least among them. Um, I'll go on, but in 1889, these are the boarding schools that were actually run by denominations, including the Episcopal denomination um, as, as part of this uh, vision. And then finally, um, the criminalization of native religions. Um, ceremonies um, like the Sundance and the Potlatch were singled out healing traditions, um, dances, and other sorts of things were all um, uh, as a matter of administrative law between the years 1881 and 1934 um, uh, 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 criminalized with courts and uh, fines and all sorts of other things. And, and Whipple may not have generated this on his own, but um, it happened kind of on his watch and he thought it was more or less uh, a good thing. Well, um, uh, a UN report that came out in 2004 um, on the boarding schools in particular um, started to tease out the uh, historical trauma that the boarding school and assimilation policy generally had um, produced among uh, Native peoples. Uh, and um, uh, we could go into this if this were um, further, um, if we had more time. Um, but. Um, uh, in addition to sort of specific abuses that happen to people, just the general, the, the, the general um, um, onslaught of 50 years of, uh, of um, federal with Christian mission um, uh, um, um, efforts to stamp out um, native um, senses of peoplehood, languages, religions, and cultures uh, proved to be deeply, 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 deeply traumatic. And so the framework of historical trauma um, is uh, among um, social scientists now the best way to sort of understand um, uh, the, the challenges that um, our native brothers and sisters, including our Episcopalian brothers and sisters in uh, Lower Sioux or White Earth or Red Lake or Leech Lake um, are, are involved and where our young people from Trinity have kind of come uh, firsthand to, uh, to sort of experience. Um, trauma, um, we could go in by the numbers, but uh, I don't want to do that here. I think I'm just going to focus on our discussion. 
So um, uh, our Episcopal presiding bishop in 2012 wrote in this pastoral letter that was about um, trying to undo the um, in, incipient racism of the of the doctrine of Christian discovery as it applies to um, the theft of North America from native peoples um, includes um, uh, a passage that I think is really, uh, really useful for um, thinking about our version of the common good um, or uh, Whipple's version of the common good as a man of his own times and God's um, image of the common good. Um, uh, Midway through this paragraph, if you can read with me, the nations from which the settlers came and the new nations which resulted in the Americas sought to impose another culture and way of life on the peoples they encountered. Attempting to remake the land and peoples they found in their own image was a profound act of idolatry. Repentance and, and amendment of life are the answer. And God asks us all, this church, our partners and neighbors and the nations which were founded under the doctrine of discovery to the challenging work of reconciliation. The abundant life we know in Jesus is made possible through sacrifice. That work is costly, but it is the only road to abundant life. So um, in some here, um, and I could go on with more details, um, but I've tried, to, I've tried to identify both this courageous Whipple, the one who uses his um, uh, uh, political um, uh, capital, um, his position, his power, his privilege, if you will, um, to go to bat for um, Dakota and Ojibwe people, um, not just as his job, but as his, uh, as his ministry, as his Christian um, duty. Um, and at the same time, um, he also uses that privilege um, to, uh, um, to help um, maybe look the other way when uh, the people that he's in sustained relationships with um, uh, um, take issue with the systems that he has uh, helped set up of boarding schools, of civilization regulations, of, uh, of allotment. Um, and it's, it's kind of this, um, I don't know, the zoom in and zoom out. Uh, so if you zoom in on him, you see a person of his times making moral choices and in some ways doing the best as he can and doing a pretty damn good job in a lot of ways. But you zoom out and you see what the historical trajectory is of his choices. Um, and it is, uh, it's one of historical trauma. I think he would be, um, I would love if he were part of our discussion today. What, what, what would he say about what places like White Earth look like now, where, where none, none of the farmers are Ojibwe people. All the land that was Ojibwe land is now owned by other farmers or by the state of Minnesota, which refuses to give it back or by the, right? Um, I wonder, and, and if you were to encounter the opioid crisis and the, the suicide rates and the loss of language and all those things, I, I wonder what he'd think. Um, and it I, kind of makes me think about if we telescope out a um, hundred years from now, uh, um, what what we think of the choices that we made now. So let's um, uh, uh, let's turn to a discussion. Um, how does our consideration of Whipple as a man of his own time, who did courageous things, um, but who also built a system that debased Native people and inflicted um, some horrible stuff, tell us about the moral choices we face today in Minnesota. What are the moral choices on race that we face? What can we learn from a courageous Whipple? And what can we learn from uh, the arrogant Whipple? Let me stop there.